All right, let's get started here. Um, just kind of some announcements, I guess. So I got to get out side by side yet uh, at home. And remember, when you do out, you still got to submit and upload to Canvas. So there's a bunch of links for people or something. Get out and Canvas side by side. I got to match up all those grades coming up. So I will try to get at that coming up. A couple other announcements. It does say in the syllabus that you, if you do better on your final exam, that we can replace your lowest score on another exam. So, for example, let's say on your final exam, you got 85 and you have a score out there that's 75. The 75 turns into an 85. All I do is type over it. So, and in past experience, I would say that. Probably 85% of the people do better on the final than one of their other tests. I would say 85% is pretty close. So I will do that. Also, on this test, you can use one side of an eight and a half by 11 sheet paper to write down whatever you want. And I'm going to let you use the blue sheet. The blue sheet. I mean, the blue sheet is old. But if you want to write down something on that one side of an eight and a half by 11 sheet paper, but then for a final exam, you can use both sides. Okay, so you, you can use the same sheet of paper, correct? So you're going to have your notes for this exam. And all you got to do is add to it. So you can use one side, eight and a half by sheet of paper. Okay. All right, let's get started here then. Um, I just looked at OWL, the last OWL assignment. You can go through almost all of that. We're going to talk about hybridization coming up. Might not be today or in the formal charge right away today. But I feel very good where we're at. I don't think we're gonna have to, we're not rushing through things. I have too much material in that learning guide. I, I'm trying to clean that up a little bit. So I mean, there, there's so much in there, but we are in pretty much perfect shape, I think. We don't have to rush through things. So the test is supposed to be weaker today, right? One week from today. So by the time we get done today, you'll be able to do formal charge. I'm not sure if we're gonna get to hybridization. Um so that you understand the real meaning of hybridization until I show you a few videos. But so let's get started again. I feel good about where we're at. And let's talk about oh, quiz. So I'll look at this quiz and see if we don't want to hear it. So in number one, what is the most likely electron configuration notation for cobalt with a plus two charge? Well, my question is. What is the configuration with cobalt with no charge, which is a cobalt atom? And what is the atomic number of cobalt? And an attendance sheet, I got to do a new one yet, so don't worry about the attendance sheet. So for cobalt, what do we got here? So cobalt is right here. So this is going to be 3D, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 3D, seven right here, correct? 3D, seven. So cobalt is going to end in 4S2, 3D, seven. If it's a cobalt ion, if it's a positive ion, we got to get rid of the electrons, right? And the electrons it's going to get rid of is the outer level valence electrons. It should get rid of those outer level. 4s2 electrons. This is I3 minus. It's kind of nice here. We can draw this out quick. Iodine is in group 17. So for total valence electrons, we're going to have three times seven plus the one for this negative charge, right? If we do total valence electrons, so that looks like we need 22. Oops, you can't see that. Somebody throw something yelling. Sorry. Three times seven for the three iodides, and then plus one because it has a negative charge. 22 valence electrons. What's the center atom? Iodine, kind of nice. All three are iodines. So we'll put iodine in the middle. And we'll put an iodine on this side and an iodine on this side. 
And the first thing we have to do is connect them. Then the next thing we need to do is complete the octet of the terminal atom. So we'll complete the octets here. We're, no, we're, we're not doing double bonds for this. We've got 16 electrons so far, correct? We need 22. What are we going to do? Put them as pairs around the central atom. And then truly, you would find it. It would look like this with an electron charge. Yes. Is it what at all? Oh, well. Yeah, but realize you got to realize that this is in three dimensional space, but you're looking at it on two dimensional paper. So, what, what do we get for bonding domains and non bonding domains? Bonding domains is two, non bonding domains is three, right? So, we got a two, three. So if we look on our sheet for our two, three, what do we get out of the two, three? Okay, this ends up being linear. So since this ends up being linear, it actually ends up being that those three non-bonded pairs are 120 degrees apart. So it actually looks like this. Let's see if I can do this. Zoom out enough. Oops, zoom out. So the non bonded pair of electrons are actually sitting in the X plane like this. This is a non bonding pair, non bonding pair, non bonding pair. And then there's an iodine on top and an iodine on the bottom. So this is linear. Now the question is is this polar or non polar? Will everything cancel out on this? Everything will cancel out, right? Your three non-bonded pairs are 120 degrees apart. That's going to cancel the dipole pulling up or the bond, uh, the polar bond pulling up and pulling down. Everything will cancel out on this. So that would end up being non -polar. We'll look at that again today and clarify that. How many pairs of bonding electrons are in the valence shell? Iodine atom and IF2. So IF2 minus. Let's do this quick. So if we have IF2 minus, both of these are in group 17. So we're going to have three times seven again plus the one. So we have 22 valence electrons. So it's going to look like So we have IF2, iodine in the middle. We are going to complete the exterior octets. That gives us 16. Doesn't matter where we put them, but we're going to have something that looks like this. Then pairs of how many pairs of bonding electrons and the pairs of bonding, there's a pair and there's a pair, huh? Right? Okay, so that's five. 8, 12, 16, 8, 12, 16. Now, um, this one right here, phosphorus is in group 15, so five valence electrons plus three times one. We get eight valence electrons for this. Does that sound right? Valence electrons. So, 
If you've got three, we'll put them 120 apart. It might not be that way in the end. We on these. That's six out of the eight. We are not going to put eight electrons around hydrogen. We can only do two. We need two more electrons. We're going to put it in there. So this gives us a, how many body domains? Three, and now body domains, one. This gives us a three, one, right? Now, it's the word approximately, right? The word approximately. What's the best one when you have a three, one right here? Three mil pyramidal, it's 107.5. For the three one one oh seven point five, so the closest to the one oh seven point five on here. Um, right. Approximately. Okay, number twelve. First of all, in number twelve, let's let's see what's junk. What I see is junk is this one. You are not going to, you can't form a double bond between iodine and chlorine. So that makes this one junk. That's how you want to approach these. Now, how about this one? Iodine only has six electrons around it. I'm going to assume that this is junk because iodine does not have a complete octet. The rest, iodine has at least eight, so it looks like I'm going to have to write it out. So if we have IF3, iodine and fluorine are in group 17, both of them. So four times seven, it looks like we've got 28 electrons. We got to do here total 28. Let's go I, we got down three, I'm going to go like this. We're going to connect those. Fill up our fluorines. So that gives us 24, right? 24, we need 28. So I don't know. We got to put, let's put two up there and put two here. So we can match that one up then. And then we got 16, huh? Number 16 next. And 16 formal charge. And we're doing formal charges today, like almost right away. Right? So formal charges we're going to do right. I should have assigned you 16. All right. So let's see where we're at and what we have to do. We still want to talk about polar versus nonpolar here in this column. We're going to fill this out today. Um, so that's coming today. And we're going to page into this. And now we can do some questions. So let's just go to page two. Now that we've done Lewis structures, we did quite a few last time. We'll look at that sheet at the end of the end. We'll do some more. Which one of these look good? Which one of these looks good? Which one doesn't look good, first of all? Let's just start with that. This looks like a mess, right? Nitrogen has 10 electrons. That's not good. That's nah, just ugly. What about this one? 
Chlorine has eight, right? Nitrogen has eight. Hydrogen has two. This looks okay, doesn't it? This one here, can we do a can we do a carbon oxygen double bond? Yeah, we can. This looks all right, doesn't it? How about this one? This looks all right, doesn't it? I don't see anything wrong here. We've got eight for the nitrogen right there. Nitrogen has eight total electrons. Eight for nitrogen, eight for the oxygen, eight for this bottom oxygen here, eight for this oxygen. This looks okay. And this is, I got it titled Not So Ugly Owl. So all of those in which the central atom obeys the octet rule. So you're just looking for 80 electrons from that central atom, right? So if I zoom in on this, got four here, two here, that looks good, eight. That's okay, isn't it? This carbon here has two, four, six, eight. That looks good, doesn't it? This one right here has how many? And that's 10 electrons, so we're not gonna check that one. It doesn't mean it's not written correctly. It just means the central atom has more than 80 electrons around it. And this one right here has how many electrons? And that's written correctly too. The common one is this beryllium here. Uh, that's less than eight, but the most common one is to have a boron. Boron only needs six electrons, so you can have a, something that looks like this. That's also less than eight. So they call that exceptions to the octet rule, less than eight or more than eight. Exceptions to the octet rule. Um, let's see. Another owl question for Xe03, the number of non bonding electrons is two, huh? The number of bonding electrons, or here's my two for the non bonding. How many total electrons? The number of bonding electrons here is six, right? What's the total eight? And it obeys the octet rule, right? Because it has a total of eight. So yes, this obeys the octet rule. Some of you have done lab. And some of you have lab today and the rest of this week. So this concept here of formal charge. So we do formal charge to figure out when you have more than one Lewis structure that looks valid, which one it is. Again, you could have more than one Lewis structure for the same compound, but which one is correct? So the formal charge is the charge on an atom in a molecule or ion calculated by assuming equal sharing of the bonding electrons. Formal charge is the valence electrons minus the number of unbonded electrons. But if you have equal sharing, then you're going to subtract out half the bonding electrons. Sounds complicated, it is not that complicated. The sum of the formal charges on the atoms in a molecule must be zero, whereas the sum for atoms in the ions must equal the charge in the ion. So let's go to the next page. And 
So on this page right here, then once you calculate all the formal charges, now I kind of outdid myself. I don't know if I want this many on here, but this is for N2O, and this is on the lab. And it's kind of goofy because if you really follow the rules, the central atom should be oxygen because it is the highest electronegativity and it is the lone atom. You would think that oxygen would be in the middle and some nitrogen would be on the outside. Trust an electron or a chemistry teacher, right? There's always exceptions. So, um, I'll do, we'll do two on this, but then I'm going to go right to these owl examples. Okay, so let's do the formal charge on this nitrogen right here. So, formal charge, Fc, is equal to valence minus non-bonding. I'm going to put just minus non. Let me let me assume this in. Valence minus non minus half bonding. Can I do it? I think we can. Valence minus non bonding minus half the bonding. Okay. How many valence electrons for nitrogen? How many valence electrons for nitrogen? Five, right? So my formal charge for this one is going to be five minus how many non bonding electrons does nitrogen have? Four, right? Four non bonding electrons. So I'm going to have five minus four minus half the bonding. How many bonding electrons are right there? That's four, right? These are my, there's four bonding electrons here, right? So there is my bonding electron. So five minus four is one minus two. My formal charge here is negative one. Let's do my formal charge on this one. My valence electrons is five. My number of non bonding electrons is two minus half my bonding electrons. And how many electrons are bonded in this thing when you consider both sides? That's six, right? Six, four on the left, two on the right. So we've got six. So what do we got there? We've got five minus two is three, minus three is, looks like zero, huh? Looks like zero. Now, do this one, oxygen, how many valence electrons? Oxygen, how many valence electrons? Six minus how many non bonding electrons there? Why is that not obeying the octet rule? This is something used. This looks like it's this has got to be missing two electrons down here, right? Because that was this has got to be missing two electrons. Let's put them in right there. So this is going to be six minus six, right? Minus one half of two. Bring up there. Take it back out. I don't know what the heck. That sounds like Six minus four minus one half of two. Sorry. 
because this gives us what for a number here? What's our total in the end? It's a plus one, right? Okay. This is plus one. It has to be plus one because this is a neutral compound. You don't see a charge, correct? If you don't see a charge, the sum of the formal charges have to add up to zero. So I knew it was plus one. It had to be plus one. When you got a negative one and a zero, it has to add up to zero. This is a plus one. But I thought that was a type of one. Okay, let's go down. Let's do what you actually have in power. We can spend, I don't want to spend more time up there, although we can calculate all those out. This is all the same structure, correct? This is three different ways to do S, C, N minus. Three different structures. Everything obeys the Aptek rule, correct? This looks good. The question is, which one of these is correct? Formal charge. Sulfur. How many valence electrons for sulfur? Six. Minus how many non-bonded electrons? Four. Minus one half the bonding electrons, and the bonding electrons is four, right? Because that's a double bond. So six minus four is two, minus two is. Looks like we got zero for that, right? Formal charge for carbon is going to be four minus zero minus one half. Right? Four minus zero, zero non body. Minus half of the body, and this should be eight, right? Eight. So it looks like we got four minus four, which is zero. Now, let me zoom this out. We do not have to calculate the last one. What does its formal charge have to be? It's got to be negative one. This is an ion, right? Remember, if it's an ion, the sum of the formal charges have to be what the ion charge is. So I don't have to calculate it. I know it's going to be negative one. Calculate it now. It can't come out to be negative one. So let's just prove that we're correct. So if I take this nitrogen right here, how many valence electrons from nitrogen? Five minus how many non bonding electrons? Four minus half the bonding. Right? That is negative one, yes. It's negative one. Five minus four is one. One minus two, right? We get negative one. All right, this sulfur, I'm just looking to see if we've done this one and we haven't. So for this sulfur right here, we're gonna have six minus six, right? Six minus six minus one half of two, two bonding. So my sulfur is negative one, right? Negative one for sulfur. My carbon is four minus zero minus one half of eight, huh? Four minus, it looks like it's gonna be four minus four, so that's zero. So what's my nitrogen have to be? It has to be zero, right? I'm not going to shock it. It has to be zero. Again, the sum has to be negative one. 
The sum has to be negative one. The sum of this one is going to be negative one. That is the charge of the ion. Okay, let's do this sulfur right here. So we are going to have six minus two minus one half of six, huh? Six valence minus these two non bonding minus one half of these six bonding. So six minus two is four. Four minus three, we have positive one and a half, eight. Got a positive one on that one. Here we have for minus zero, minus one half of eight, right? So that's zero. What's this nitrogen going to be? End up being minus two, right? I'm already seeing this is going to be garbage, but let's calculate it out. So five minus six minus one half of two is negative two, right? Okay, so this one, let's go up to see which, so we got to decide the structure that contributes most significantly to the overall electronic structure is, we got to pick one, A, B, or C. Well, I don't know which one it is. Let's go up here, number one. Uh, molecular structure in which all formal charges are zero is preferred. None of them qualify, correct? Let's go to number two. If the Lewis structure must have non-zero formal charges, the arrangement with the smallest non-zero formal charges is preferable. Well, with the lowest, smallest non-zero formal charges, this negative two right here throws this one away. You're not gonna end up with a negative two. Okay, number three. Lewis structures are preferable when adjacent formal charges are zero or of the opposite sign. Well, these adjacents are zero and these adjacents are zero, correct? And this is normally you have a bet you, you have it figured out with. Right? But let's go down to this. We have to go to number four on this. When we must choose among several Lewis structures with similar distributions of formal charges, the structure with the negative formal charges on the more electronegative atom is preferred. So that's what we got to look at. So we have, we have negative one on sulfur in this one, and we've got negative one on the nitrogen in this one. Which one is more electronegative? Okay, we're going to look on the back side of our periodic table. If you do lab, there's the electronegativity is in your lab. Sulfur for the electronegativity is 2.58 for sulfur and for nitrogen, 3.04. But we want the negative charge to be on the nitrogen. The negative charge on the nitrogen is structure A. No? So we have to do quite a bit on that. So formal charge, not going to be that complicated to figure out, right? Normally, it doesn't shake out to number four. Okay. okay. 
So residents, we looked at resonant structures, and the reason we have resonant structures again is because our bond lengths end up being exactly the same. So this is for ozone, O3. They have scientifically measured that the bond lengths are exactly the same, but we know the bond length for triple bonds is shorter than double bonds, and double bonds is, I should reverse that. Single bonds are the longest bond length. Double bonds are then shorter, but triple bonds are the shortest. So we would expect this bond length here to be shorter than this one because it's a double bond, correct? But the scientific research has showed us that the bond lengths are exactly the same. So therefore, we do resonance structures to show both uh, possibilities of the bond, the double bond from here on the right to the oxygen on the left. And if you I guess if that flips back and forth with the speed of light, you won't notice any difference. Okay, exceptions to the octet rule. What do we just mean by exceptions to the octet rule? And that is less than eight on the central atom or greater than eight. And then just some flat out goofiness. So an odd number of valence electrons. Then you get a free radical. Again, less than eight boron trifluoride is like the poster child for less than eight valence electrons. And then more than eight. So those are just some exceptions to the octet rule. All right, let's go to this is the next table. And again, I think I just got too much information in this learning guide, but so here we have more than eight valence electrons around the central atom. For all of these. All right, let's talk about molecular shapes. And we already filled some of these in, but we do this according to what's called Vesper, which is valence shell. Oops, I'm missing an E in there. Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. What does that mean? The electrons are just trying to get as far away from each other as they can. So these are the shapes that we come up with. Obviously, the linear, this linear here is a two zero. If we have a three zero, get trivial pointer. If we have a four zero, we get tetrahedral 109.5. So Here's my 109.5, right? No matter which way I flip this, this is exactly the same. 109.5 degrees. Now, again, when you draw this out on paper and there's one in the lab and students think it's nonpolar, if I take this apart, If I have on two dimensional paper, it would look like this. If I put these two straight across from each other, let's call these two chlorines, they would cancel out. One's pulling this way, one's pulling this way, correct? And if I make this a hydrogen and this a hydrogen, it looks like this would cancel out. And again, if you draw it on two dimensional paper, 
looks like they're all canceled, but it's not. In real space, it's in 3D. And no matter what I do, if I put two atoms on this thing, I can never put them 180 degrees apart. So there is my tetrahedron picture. So this is a four to zero, 109.5. If I have a three one, if I have a three one, all I do is take one off, doesn't matter which one. I take one off, I've got a non-bonded pair and the three one is going to repel these a little bit tighter and my angle becomes 107.5. If I take another one off, I have water. If I take another one off, I have water. Again, what's my bond angles right now for a 3 1? 107.5. If I take one of these off, now I have two non bonding domains. It actually pushes them tighter together. And now I go from 107.5 to 104.54 pins. It's just the repulsion. All right, so trigonal planar though is in two dimensional space. So my first three zeros in two dimensional space, they're all 120. When you go to four zero, you have tetrahedral. When we go to Go to five zero. When we go to five zero here, the center ones are one hundred and twenty. The same as this one twenty, which is trigonal or trigonal planar. Then, if we peak this up like this, and also down below. You can make a pyramid on top, pyramid on the bottom. So you have trigonal bipyramidal. That's my five zero and the six zero. We get octahedral. Okay. And here is just some more shapes. Let's go to. I'm going to go to the end worksheet we were working on again and then come back here. Because I want to do the organics. And I'll do this again. I don't remember if this is in a last assignment. Does anybody know where it draws out these organic carbon compounds? Is it in the last assignment for all? Yeah, it's in the last one. Okay, let's draw this out. And I think I took this directly from Paul. So, for organic compounds, carbon needs four bonds. It can be a double bond, it can be triple bonds, but it needs four bonds. Hydrogen only has one bond. Oxygen usually forms two bonds, two singles or a double bond. Nitrogen usually forms three bonds. So, if we draw these compounds out, so let's draw out ethane here, and I'm going to use dashes. First thing you want to do is connect your carbons. So we have CH3, CH3, connect your carbons. Then carbon needs four bonds. Now my carbon has four bonds. Each of these is a hydrogen here. There's my CH3. This is ethane. If it ends in A, it's going to be all single bonds. It's easy then. By the way, this is my ethane. 
And what it does, if we look at it like this, in order to get as far away from each other as possible, this will rotate. It would look like this. Carbon, carbon, three hydrogens. If it ends in A-N-E, if it gives you the name, it's really, really simple. Carbon, carbon, carbon. Connect your three carbons. You need three bonds. Excuse me, four bonds. I just gave every carbon four bonds, right? Now you just fill in your hydrogens. Here's my CH3 on the first one. Then I have CH2. I have CH3. A-N-E, single bonds. All single bonds. If, if it ends in E-N-E for the name, you're going to have some double bonds. First of all, you have C2H2, connect your carbon. Put your hydrogens on the outside. And I'm going to actually do this. Put our hydrogens on the outside. And if you know there's hydrogens on these dashes, you can actually skip writing them in. Just going to write them in for now. Oh, I got that wrong, don't I? I've got that wrong. I want to fix this thing. C2H2 is going to be a trivial one. I've got this wrong. Fix this up. I swear I fixed this thing up. This is CH2. CH2. So. CH2, CH2. So CH2, CH2 is what it should be. Let me zoom in. So I have two carbons connected. I have H2 and I have H2, agreed? But carbon, every carbon only has how many bonds? Three. My only solution is to put a double bond in the middle. That gives carbon four bonds and 80 electrons total. Now we have CH2, CH, CH3. What's the first thing you should do? Connect three carbons. Put in your hydrogens. My first carbon has two hydrogens. My second carbon only has one hydrogen, CH. My third carbon has three hydrogens. Which carbon here needs help? First one, right? This carbon has four bonds. This carbon here has three bonds. This carbon here has three bonds. If I put a double bond right there, that makes everybody happy. I'm doing four total bonds for a total of 80 electrons, correct? Four total bonds around the carbons, always for carbon. Four total bonds for eight total electrons. Okay. 
Okay, if I go down here, this should be a triple bond, which it is. So the first thing you should do is connect your carbons. I've got three carbons. This first carbon has one hydrogen. There. The second carbon does not have any hydrogens, right? It's just a C, and the last carbon has three hydrogens. Did not add any more hydrogens. What do I need to do here? Well, this carbon here only has two bonds. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to put a triple bond right there. This carbon has four bonds, right? This carbon right there has four bonds. This carbon right here has four bonds. And this carbon has four bonds. Connect your carbons. This is kind of deceiving. I don't like this, but the only way for this to work is fluorine, 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 fluorine. I'm going to double on. All right. Why don't I go down to this one? This is ethanol. What's the first thing you should do? Connect your carbons. Put in your hydrogens. You should do dashes now. It's going to be cleaner. Every dash is going to be a hydrogen. Right? This is my CH3. Now I have CH2. There's my CH2. Now I got to add an O. There's my O. How many bonds does oxygen have? Two bonds, either two singles or a double bond. We need to add our H right there. This is CH3, CH2, and then OH. My oxygen has a bond here and a bond here. Okay. Now let's do formaldehyde. Formaldehyde here is carbon. There's a hydrogen and a hydrogen. I'm actually going to put them in. I need an oxygen here. There's my CH2, correct? But I have an oxygen here yet. How many more bonds does this carbon need? It needs two more bonds, correct? And oxygen can form a double bond. Again, oxygen. Two bonds total, either a double or two singles. So this is the correct structure for formaldehyde. So if I do acid aldehyde, what should I do? Connect my carbons. There's my CH3. I need an H. There's my CH3, there's my CH. I still need an oxygen. And what do I got to put in there? I need a double bond again. CH3, CH, CO. CH3, 
Let's do this on me. Carbons connected to a nitrogen. There's my CH3, right? Nitrogen has how many hydrogens on it? Two, right? And that's it. How many bonds does nitrogen usually have? Three, and it has three. This nitrogen has three bonds, right? To summarize again, carbon has how many bonds total? Four. Nitrogen has two, either two singles or a double. And nitrogen will have three, and hydrogen will always be one. All right, one to go here. So we've got carbon, carbon together first. Then we need CH3. Got an O. This is going to be my O and my H. I don't know if you would know this one. Maybe I don't know. This is my OH, but I've still got another O to do, correct? And this carbon needs how many more bonds? Two. Okay, what I'd like to do now is fill in the blue sheet on the right, polar versus non-polar. And clarify some things. What we really here is does this have a net dipole? Is the term. Actually, I don't want to clarify something else. We have just in the time here. I didn't mean to lie to you. I want to go to the learning guide on page. This page right here, page eight. I'm just going to do a couple of these first. And you're going to do this in lab. And this might be the table from the lab. This here is a table of electronegativities. You also have that table of electronegativities to two decimal places on the back side of your periodic table, right? Electronegativities. What is electronegativity? It's the pull for shared electrons. Whichever one has the highest number, we assign the negative charge to. Now, let's look at this. We describe bonds as pure covalent. This is the electronegativity difference. Difference in electronegativity. It's called nonpolar covalent if the electronegativity is less than 0.4. Your lab write up says 0.5. So that number is not set in stone depending upon which textbook you look at. This textbook does 0.39 or 0.4. Then it's called polar covalent if it's between 0.4 and 1.79. It's ionic if it's greater than 1.8. So for this, here is carbon hydrogen. What is the electronegativity of carbon from the back side of our periodic table? 
Carbon here is 2.55. And hydrogen right here is 2.20. Now, whichever one is the highest electronegativity as this bond dipole associated with it, we put the negative charge there. What is this symbol? Just make it eight and don't complete it on the top right. I made an eight like this and I'm just not going to complete the top right. This is called a von dipole. What you'll see is you'll see an arrow pointing towards the negative like this. Now, is this bond polar or nonpolar? And since it's less than 0.39, this is nonpolar. Let's do sulfur and hydrogen here. Sulfur is, well, let's not do sulfur and hydrogen. Let's do nitrogen and nitrogen, 3.04. They're both 3.04. This is N2. What's the electronegativity difference? Zero, right? This is zero. This actually looks like this, by the way. We would call this pure covalent. Now, covalent is just sharing of electrons. Now, in lab this week, you don't have one like this, but lithium fluoride. What is it for lithium? Zero point nine eight, and fluorine is three point nine eight. What's my electronegativity difference? Three point zero zero, correct? Which one of these is the most electronegative? Fluorine wins the tug of war always. So this is going to be my negative. This is going to be my positive. I would see something that looks like this. And what type of bond is that? Zionic. How do you know when you have an ionic bond nine times out of 10? It starts with a metal. So those are some different bonds. And now that we talked about these bonds, the question is the molecule as a whole, will it have a dipole moment or will it all cancel out? is what we're going to go to here, and I'm going to show this on the screen as well. For something to be nonpolar, something to be nonpolar, outside terminal atoms need to be the same, and the bond angles need to cancel out. Think of a tug of war always. If I take carbon here, which one's more electromagnetic here? Carbon or oxygen? Oxygen is 3.44. Carbon is 2.58. So you'll see a bond dipole that looks like this. It's going to pull towards oxygen this way. It's going to pull towards this oxygen this way. What is the net effect of that? It is going to cancel. 
this is going to be nonpolar. It cancels out. Oxygen is pulling on those shared electrons. One oxygen is pulling to the right, one oxygen is pulling to the left. That's nonpolar. We have CN. Which one of these is more electronegative? Carbon or nitrogen? It's going to be nitrogen. Then the question is, is there any way that that's going to cancel? No. I'm going to put a red in here. This is going to be polar. Now, we have NO3, but it would be resonance structures. What is my bond? Are my terminal outside terminal atoms the same? Yes, right? What is my bond angles? What is my bond angle for this? 120. So I would have a bond dipole going this way, a bond dipole going this way, and a bond dipole going this way. At 120 degrees apart, all of that is going to cancel. Nonpolar. Here I have B. H2, does this cancel? No. If you have a non bonded pair, if you have a non bonded pair of electrons, the only way for that to cancel is to have another non bonded pair 180 apart from it. If you see a low non bonded pair, that has to be polar. How about oxygen? This is just going to share these electrons equally. This right here should be nonpolar. It would just share them equally. Okay, we have CH4. Should this all cancel out? Yeah, that's all going to cancel out. The terminal atoms are the same. Now, again, you have one in lab where Two of them are chlorine and two of them are hydrogen. Again, you cannot get them straight apart from each other. We have NH3, polar or nonpolar? That's polar for sure, right? You've got a non-bonded pair of electrons. H2O. As written, it looks like it would be nonpolar, but that's not the shape. For H2O, I just take two of these off. In three dimensional space, if I take two of these off, that's not straight across from each other, right? That's not going to cancel out. That for sure is polar. I have OH minus. Is this going to cancel out? No, this is going to be hard. All right, now we got to be able to visualize. Check this out. My terminal, this is a this is a five zero, correct? Are my terminal atoms all the same? Yes. Will this middle section cancel out? What is the angle on my x-axis middle section? 120, correct? That will cancel out. And then the up-down will cancel out, correct? Even though the angles do not match, this is going to cancel out. This is nonpolar. I have a non-bonded pair here, so this has to be polar. This one right here is tough to visualize, but look at my angle. My angle is 120. My angle is 120. So if my angle is 120,
my PF3s are at 120 like this. Where's my two bond, non bonded pairs? One, to do it like this, one is on top, one is on the bottom. So that would cancel out, correct? So this right here should be nonpolar. Next one is exactly opposite. My next one, notice my angle's 180 on that. So on my next one, my three like this in the middle are three non-bonded pairs. So my three non-bonded pairs are going to cancel out because they're 120 degrees apart. And I've got an iodine on top and an iodine on the bottom. This is not a pole. Two here that are exactly the same, so they're going to share equally nonpolar. What about this one? Everything on this is 90 degrees. That's going to cancel nonpolar. We've got a single non bonded pair here. That's going to be polar. For the next one. Let's see what we got on that. What's my bond angles here? This is 90. So what that looks like is this. Zoom this out. Here's my four bonds sitting in the X plane like this. This is a 4-2. These are going to cancel, correct? And I have a non-bonded pair on top and a non-bonded pair on the bottom that are going to cancel. This is a 4-2 that cancels out. So this is non-polar. My angle here is not 120. It's less than 90. This does not cancel out. How about this one? This is the opposite of the previous one. This time I have, I have four non-bonded pairs, four non-bonded pairs. I got a bond on top and a bond on the bottom that's going to cancel out. This is non-polar. And this is polar. Okay, let's look at our quiz, see how far we can get in this. Um, on the quiz, you can do all but not 21. 22 and 23 and 8, 29, 30. 29 and 30. Those are the ones you should not do. Not 21, 22, 23, 28, 29, 30. We will cover those next time we meet. Test week from today. Start making your cheat sheet for the test. Yes. And that owl, you still pranked out 99, 90% uh, of that owl for sure. For sure. You can prank out a bunch of that owl. <laughs> 